let me introduce Katya. She's going to be discussing um, the topic of exploring decolonization at MC uh, that has to do with curriculum planning and design. All right, good morning. Thanks everyone for joining us today um, for this session on curriculum planning and design. So this session focuses on um, how we can decolonize a curriculum and uh, how we can structure our planning of our courses around decolonial thinking. And by the end of the session, um, we'll have evaluated current aspects of curriculum planning and design from a decolonial vantage point, And we'll outline some ideal curriculum processes that promote inclusive inclusivity, um, at least, you know, kind of what I've been thinking about and what I've been developing along these lines. So as um, some of you may know, this workshop is part of a, uh, a larger series, six part workshops that um, we've been working on uh, at MC, and it focuses on what decolonization, um, what what decolonizing higher education would look like at Montgomery College. So I'm going to let Angela talk a little bit about the context of how this work grew and, and was developed this year. Okay, good morning, everyone. And as, as Katya said, this workshop is a part of a six workshop series, and we'll also be doing other activities around um, decolonizing the curriculum and decolonizing MC. And this comes from, it's a grant that's um, offered to um, uh, the most grant, it really focuses on creating um, open, open educational resources that can be used for other, not just other faculty here at the college, but also across Maryland. And so what we create as a part of this series will be available to um, all, all faculty, staff will have access to it. And one of the things we really wanted to focus on here is looking at what could decolonizing look like at MC? And if we look at some resources out there, they will say the only way to really decolonize is give back the land, you know, change all these practices, which is in many cases beyond what we, the scope of what we can do in our daily jobs. So we have to start thinking about how do we operationalize those principles of decolonization and what are some things that faculty and staff can do in their um, daily in their daily tasks and when working with students that will address some of those principles of decolonizing. So a big part of this grant is in helping members of the MC community first understand what decolonizing is. And secondly, think about what can we do no matter what level at the college we, we um, or what role we hold, what is it that we can do to try and work toward those principles? And it's really aligned with the institutional goal that was uh, created by the, the board last, last fall on um, working toward or engaging in the journey to be towards becoming an anti-racist institution. So this work aligns nicely with a lot of initiatives that are already here at the college. Um, and so in the end, we'll be creating a press book that will gather all of the information, the feedback, the examples, the sample activities and assignments and things that faculty create. Um, we'll all go into that press book publication that we can share with other institutions. Thank you so much, Angela, for that summary. So first off, I wanna do introductions. Um, I'm hoping that this session will be interactive. So, you know, if I know if you can put on your uh, camera, that would be great. You don't have to, obviously. Um, who am I? I am uh, Dr. Katya Sami. I've been at MC for about um, five years now, I think. And I teach sociology from the Rockville campus. My areas of research and interest are around critical race theory, racial equity, gender equity, um, coloniality. And you can reach me at the address here. Um, I would like, since we're not that many, I, I would like us to go around and introduce our, each other or ourselves, just um, because we, do, we might not all know each other. Um, so if we could just do a brief, hello, who, are, who am I and which area of the college do I work at? Um, and you know, if you have a particular interest in, in decolonizing, please share with us. So Angela, I'll kick it off with you. Hi, I'm Angela Lanier. I think I know everybody, maybe one person I'm not 
familiar with. I'm an instructional designer based on the Rockville campus. I've been at MC just over seven years. Great, thank you. Uh, Phil, you're next on my... Hi, my name is Phil Bonner. Uh, I'm also an instructional designer with uh, Elite. I've been with Elite uh, now for about three years, but I have been with the college in various capacities for, uh, I think it's 25 years now. So uh, yeah, in addition to being an instructional designer, I also teach uh, ESL part-time. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm really, maybe we can talk at some point because I'm doing some work with an organization that does, that wants to decolonize ESL and um, I'd love to maybe chat at a later point. Sure. Uh, Gloria, do you want to introduce? Sure. Hi, um, I'm Gloria Barron. I know everyone here pretty much. <laughs> um, I've been with college for quite a while and um, I'm going on my Actually, I just passed my 11th year. I work for the Office of Elite as an instructional designer. And I also like to uh, share that I teach uh, computer science courses part-time. Um, that's kind of like my side gig and I enjoy it a lot. And today I'm really excited to hear more about your topic, which is so interesting. And I like to just learn more about it. So this is kind of like my first step towards that. Thanks. Great, thank you. Laurent? Uh, Lauren Deze, also instruction designer with Elite, and uh, I have been uh, with MC for 13 years. Um, I'm interested in, uh, in the subject because I, way back when I was in uh, teacher's college, I learned about curriculum and even with instruction design. And at that time, we didn't, we didn't see any colonization element of it. And I'm interested in uh, understanding uh, how uh, colonization uh, uh, is in, in, embedded or affects the implementation of any curriculum. Great, thank you. Caroline? Hi, I'm Caroline Anning. I'm also an instructional designer with uh, Elite. I've been with the college for 17 years. Um, I've always been interested in education in, um, you know, in diverse societies, uh, considering my family background, I've always been interested in education in, in the colonies and post-colonial. So uh, I'm really excited to now notice that finally, you know, this has, this is catching on that people are daring to say anti-racist education because it has taken a long time for people to be ready to actually use the R word. So I am I'm super excited to hear about how now in this day and age, uh, this, you know, the decolonization is interpreted. So uh, um, I'm very excited to hear your story today. Thank you, um, Katie. Hi, I'm Katie Hubley. I teach in the Media Arts and Technologies Department. Um, I did the elite training this summer and some additional efforts for um, creating inclusive materials and uh, happy to be here and participating in this important work. Thank you. Um, thank you. Relevant? I hope I pronounced that all right. Yes, hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Raluca Teodorescu and I teach physics at Tacoma Park. Um, I am here to learn from elite. I mean, whatever you put together, I, if I have one hour and I can spend with you, uh, I end up learning so much. So I'm looking forward to, to learning any ideas from you. Thank you. Thank you. And hi, Henry. So um, quite a few people in this meeting I'm already very familiar with. Um, so I've been uh, at the college for, for several years, many years, maybe Caroline and I came in around the same time. And I, I'm in the Rockville campus in the ELAP program, the ESL program at the Rockville campus. Uh, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in this topic. I know that quite a bit of the materials that we have used or even some of the essays that we, that we ask our students to read uh, maybe could reflect uh, some different different approaches or different ideas. Uh, I was involved in a workshop with the right. I do tutoring as well, and the writing center had a workshop in the summer around this topic. 
Um, and it just seemed like we didn't finish. I mean, there was not enough time to get what we needed to do. And so I'm, I'm really excited just to, to listen in what you guys have uh, in our discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and I know uh, Rashi and Nancy introduced themselves in the chat and for various reasons can't introduce themselves out loud. So thank you, Nancy and Rashi. And Paul, do you wanna say um, hello? Maybe Paul is in a meeting, but he is like okay. not listening for right now, but he'll chime in a little bit later. It's all good. Um, but thank you all for taking the time to introduce yourselves. Um, I think it's important to, to you know, in building this community around decolonizing and moving this work forward at MC, I think it's important to get to know each other. And, and also um, the goal is, is not for just me, for me to be talking at you all. Um, and it's for all of us to be to be having a conversation about how we can apply some of these principles in in our different areas. Um, so so thank you all for that. What I would like to do today is to do a brief overview of decolonizing the curriculum. I'm not going to go into it in in a huge amount of detail. I'm going to focus more on on the practicalities of it and um, today in terms of how we can apply it to the curriculum. Um, I'm gonna go over some guiding principles that I've used to guide my work and to kind of structure my work, especially in thinking about the feedback that I've received in, in the last year or so, um, doing presentations on this and, and, and talking to, to various folks at the college about this topic. I wanna spend some time talking about positionality and where we're all coming from. And we've already started to do that in the introduction. So it'll be diving a little bit deeper into that. And then we're gonna look at subjectivity and knowledge and what, um, what it would mean, what it would look like to decolonize knowledge and curriculum at MC and the implications for teaching. Um, Angela, do you mind like, if there's anything in the chat that I need to pay attention to, could you let me know um, as we go? Um, yeah, so, it's okay. I can do that for you too. Angela's microphone's not working right now. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. I was, I was on mute. Sorry. Um, just if, if you came in afterwards, please use the sign in link that Gloria posted so you can sign into the session. Um, and other than that, I think that's all we have in the chat for now. Okay. Thank you. So, um, when we think about decolonizing higher education, I like to focus on this particular quote from Keele University and their manifesto because they've done some really interesting work around decolonizing higher education. And I particularly like this approach, which says that decolonizing higher education involves a paradigm shift from a culture of exclusion and denial to the making of space for other political philosophies and knowledge systems. So I interpret that as meaning that decolonizing learning is about shifting paradigms reflecting on all subjects from a new vantage point and considering the extent to which materials are presented from a narrow viewpoint. And if you, you know, if you have questions, if I'm not giving enough details about what decolonizing itself is, then please feel free to interrupt, um, but hopefully it'll become clear as we go. So in thinking about what decolonizing higher education is, I'd like to, to think about the kind of have us thinking about it as an intentional process. For me, it's not just an afterthought, like kind of a, a tick box exercise where maybe we find an indigenous author that we can include in our work and, and just kind of jam it into our syllabus, right? It's something that we should be thinking about as we build our courses or what, you know our, our work as we approach it. Um, just like now we're working, as Caroline mentioned, towards an anti-racist institution, it should be at the forefront of our work. But at the same time, it's not all or nothing. It's not going to happen in one day. You, you know, I think some people might be overwhelmed and say, well, I don't have time to decolonize my syllabus. It's, you know, we have so many other things to, to work on. So I, I, do, I don't wanna discourage folks and I want us to think about how we can start small and build up and how it's also, it's okay if it's a work in progress, as long as we're thinking about it and, 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 and you know, constantly having that intentionality. 
I also, for me, like to think about it as not an attack, right? Some people might feel like what they know, what they love, what they've experienced their whole life is under attack by talking about decolonizing. You know, and conversations around anti-racism, conversations around decolonizing sometimes um, are uncomfortable. And people feel like they themselves are being personally kind of attacked by this process, but it's not an attack, at least not the way I approach it. You know, for me, it's about opening up how we view education, how we view knowledge and how we can be more inclusive in, in our teaching and our work and, and with our students. And so, you know, there's a, there's a debate happening. It's like, well, this is all just cancel culture and we just want to get rid of everything and, you know, kind of um, throw everything out. And maybe some folks do call for like kind of a complete like restructuring. But uh, the way I envision decolonizing in my work, it's about building on what has existed. I think it, there's so much value in looking at works that maybe, you know, used to be idolized or highly valued and not getting rid of them, but thinking critically about what role they've played in colonization, um, what role they've played in racism and using the, those in my teaching to further expand the kind of learning experience and critical thinking around all of these topics. And as I mentioned um, in my kind of with the first point, it's not just about a token addition. Um, it, it really, it needs to be a more systematic, system-wide institutional process. So the first step I think in this work is really to acknowledge our own uh, positionality. So, you know, a lot of talk around decolonizing higher education is around decentering knowledge and sub subjectivities, right? Shifting those paradigms and perspectives. And so my thoughts on this is that we need to try to better understand what we bring to the table um, as instructors or in our work. I think a lot, there's a lot of really great talk at the college about what our students need, right? Um, we kind of focus on the student needs, where they're coming from, um, what their backgrounds are, but just as valuable, I think, is thinking about where we're coming from in interacting with our students. And I think this is part of that conscious, intentional step um, to, to put us in a better position to start that process of decolonizing. I like this, um, this summary of what positionality is. Uh, so positionality, one's positionality is not only formed by lived personal experiences, but is shaped by the social constructs that make up those experiences. While everyone has their own personal viewpoints and opinions, those opinions are formed by experiencing life within social institutions. So um, when we think about positionality, I like to think about it in terms of social position and power. It refers to differences in social position and how power shapes our identities and access in society. Um, these shape our identities and also how we navigate the world. So through considering our positionality, we are trying to identify our status through factors of race, class, educational attainment, income, ability, gender, um, citizenship, among many others. And in acknowledging positionality, we also acknowledge intersecting social locations and complex power dynamics. And actually, this photo is, for me, very personal, and I wanted, I used it, this image, to reflect my positionality. Um, I'm Moroccan, and this is a picture um, from Morocco. And and I wanted to, I'm not gonna, you know, I was trying to think about my own positionality in preparing this presentation and, and, you know, we all have complex journeys, but, you know, if I ask myself, why am I interested in, in this topic? It's very personal to me. I am the, the product of colonialism. Um, my paternal grandfather is Moroccan and my maternal, my paternal grandmother is French and they, my grandfather went to France from Morocco to study and they, they met there and then they, they got married and they moved back to Morocco. 
and, and their stories are fascinating, uh, but it's always been a contentious union, right? The kind of colonizer colonized because Morocco was colonized by France uh, dynamic really influenced their marriage, their relationships, their children. My, you know, my dad's name is Jean Jamil, like, so John Jamil. Um, he only uses Jamil in his everyday life, but he has that, like, his name just reflects that multiplicity of his cultural experiences. Um, and, and so for me, I saw how race and colonialism shaped relationships, like how my grandmother was treated by Moroccan family as this kind of oppressive figure in Morocco, uh, but also she was oppressed as a woman um, who, who accessed education in France when women could not really access education. So, so that's just a little tidbit about kind of where I'm coming from um, in terms of my interest in coloniality. Position, my position is also really influenced by my experience as a migrant. I moved here when I was three um, from Morocco and I, I have always been a migrant. I, I moved to Canada for my undergrad. I moved to the UK for graduate school. Um, and and I, I always live in this kind of multicultural third culture kid kind of world. And that has shaped who I am. And in some ways it really um, has benefited me when teaching at Montgomery College. I, I can, um, my students and I kind of understand each other for those who have those similar experiences. But sometimes it also is a problem with some students who, who might not have those experiences and who, who, who sometimes, you know, I've experienced some issues with some students who, who didn't necessarily like that about me, right? So in some ways it can connect more with students, but in some ways it also puts me, it can put me at a disadvantage sometimes. And so I wanted to share with you all my positionality uh, because I, I, I'm going to ask you now to think about your positionality. And I want you, I'm going to, you know, you can t turn your camera off uh, if you want to, or we can just mute and, and, and reflect for five minutes until maybe, let's say, 930. I want you to take a look at some of these questions and, and write down some notes and, and think about what your positionality is and, and, and how it influences your work. And maybe if you're not, you know, I know some of you maybe are not instructors and you're kind of a day-to-day, -day, although, um, you know, and I know some of you, I've attended your, your workshop, so you do instruct in, 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 in some ways. Uh, so, so just think about these questions from your work and, um, and then we're gonna share a little bit what you've come up with. So I'll, I'm going to mute myself until 9.30 and, and let us reflect on that. All right. Um, so thank you for taking the time to, to answer or reflect on some of these questions. Um, I would like us to share a little bit uh, what you you might have come up with. What did this evoke for you? Um, you know, were you were, have you already done this? Is it surprising? Um, anyone want to share? Yeah, Henry. Yeah. You know, so I I always reflect on. Um, my own experiences as a student. I, I attended community college uh, as well, and I didn't finish my education in the four years that everybody says you should get your bachelor's degree in. So I, I can kind of reflect, you know, um, I get, well, I, I see how I can connect with students that are in our, in our classes, you know, working and they have other responsibilities. I, um, and so I, I always try to, to help students if they, you know, we have office hours and they're talking about something they're struggling in. I share my own experiences. And that's, that's something that I do. I, I haven't, I mean, I, I do that to a certain extent in the class, but I also don't want it to be about me as well. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I'm really careful about that. If, if students ask me for some advice or something in an office hour, that's something different. Um, but I really like that last question 
because I always go back and I think, okay, so I, I, I teach writing classes. And so some, uh, some part of the writing is going to be subjective, right? When we do that grading uh, or when, when students do research and they submit a, a topic for you or, or whatever it is, we, we tend to put in our own um, ideas. And so I kind of have struggled with some of that. Uh, how, much, how much is it? Am I putting power, you know, my own power over students like you can't pick that topic and it has to be this topic or uh, rather than guiding them you know I'm, I'm trying to work on that a lot more but that's all i wanted to share thanks great thank you henry um anyone else yeah i guess i'll chime in here uh i'm, I'm gonna piggyback on what henry was saying hi henry uh this uh henry and i both uh, teach esl and writing in particular so um, <clears throat> a lot of what he was saying was really resonated with me and uh, the questions that you posed um, <clears throat> uh, really got me to, to, to think a little bit about my, my practice. You, one of the questions you posed was, you know, exerting power over, um, over students. I, th that's a concept that I've always wrestled with. Th th this is for me a very uncomfortable uh, um, reality, I guess, uh, you know, I, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't want to exert power over anyone, you know, uh, but, but uh, by, by its very nature, the, 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 the teacher student dynamic uh, re requires that, or that, that's built in or baked into, into that nature of that relationship. So I guess the way that I have dealt with my uncomfortableness is by trying to give them as much freedom and leeway as possible to explore topics and ideas. Um, and, you know, when I am grading paper course, we teach grammar and writing, you know, I, I want to make as few corrections or amendments to their writing as possible. You know, I, I'm not, I don't want to be changing what they're saying. And so I do so only in as far as, or only to the extent that, um, you know, that it, that, it, that it becomes grammatical. So uh, I, again, as much as possible, that, that light touch is, is important, I think. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And, and uh, Henry, I attended one of your workshops maybe three or four years ago on, on teaching on evaluating students who's, uh, who, for whom English is not their first language. And, and I still struggle with this. Like I still struggle with the grading aspect and, and um, you know, not wanting to reduce the, the level of, of exigency, you know, what we expect from them. But at the same time, you know, kind of wanting to maintain standards, but then also thinking about all these dynamics, especially as like reflecting on these questions. And, and it's still something that I'm working on, on how to do that as an instructor. Um, and thank you, Phil. Uh, anybody else want to share? Yeah, Katya. <clears throat> yeah, go if ahead. I may add some um, here too. I think as an instructor, you always have power over your students. And I, I just want to shift it away from the grading to, you know, you're a role model. So for me, it's always important to immediately go to that place, you know, to when we introduce each other, when we get to know each other, icebreakers, to immediately say, hey, I'm from here. This is my family. I'm an immigrant. Am I biracial? I'm bilingual. You know, my parents, my grandparents were refugees from a colony in Europe. And, you know, I want to open, I want to use that power to open and to show the students, this is interesting stuff. And you all have interesting stories. And, you know, this is a place where we want to tap into the stories. So that's how I see the power that I have as an instructor to really to decolonize in a sense, to step away from the neutral knowledge to, hey, this is my personal story. And it's one of, you know, it's one of race and racism and, uh, and diversity, uh, the good stuff too. And, you know, that's, that will always be part of my teaching. So please step into your own history. You know, that's the message. And that's what I want to use my power for in the classroom. That's, that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, uh, I also want to share a bit of, of that experience. Well, uh, for me, it's like my everyday experience. 
I'm also a product of a colonial uh, education. I lived in many African countries, Rwanda, Kenya, and West African countries like uh, Liberia. I actually taught there for several years in, in high school, preparing students, uh, getting ready for college in the 11th and 12th grade. And when I was teaching and I, I noticed how uh, students were struggling to uh, step away from the uh, mixed language, like pigeon, what they may call pigeon English into the real conventional standard English. I could empathize uh, the way myself, I learned so many different languages, Swahili, French, English, so many of them. So I could really empathize how they struggle. And, uh, and then later on, I, I, I studied a lot of the psychology of learning and instruction. So when I see people struggling and later on, I, I notice that there is progress, they are, they, they are really beginning to see the rewards and I get all the praises for doing, influencing that. I, I feel really good that I have accomplished something. No, thank you for sharing. Yeah, no, it's, I, I love how everyone's bringing these different perspectives for, for, from their life experiences and how it influences your work. Katie, I saw you had your hand up earlier. Do you want to add anything? I just wanted to um, uh, mention, uh, Henry, um, I was also a, a community college student at Montgomery College and a first year college student. And what I think what really st struck me as I continued to, to learn and gain a broader perspective, but I'm still doing that, but to, you know, that was, it was difficult to carve out my path and my career, um, you know, with that. But, but looking at our, seeing our students and how they struggle and how they, um, you know, is working as a college student and seeing that plus the, the, um, the other challenges that they're dealing with that I didn't deal with. So they're, you know, dealing with the systemic racism, having fewer opportunities, um, just, you know, it, it, it really just inspires me, um, because of what, what I went through um, and then seeing how much more difficult it is for them, it just blows me away what they're able to accomplish. Thank you. And I know there's some great points also being added to the chat. Um, so thanks for those who are continuing the conversation there. Any final thoughts before we, we move to um, the, we kind of move on? You can always bring stuff in, you know, you can always add stuff as we go. Um, so, so thank you for, for that exercise and participating in it. I, I, I think um, pretending that we don't have that background, I think is a detriment to, to our experiences as at Montgomery College. And, I, and because we, like I said, we consider our students' backgrounds often. Um, and, and not only do we bring that to the classroom, but we also experience things as, you know, as colleagues, right? Um, there are a lot of issues in higher education around um, racism that that faculty face or that, you know, like that, that people experience um, sexism and so on. So, so we, I think it's useful to think about this um, in order to kind of move forward with this conversation. And, you know, kind of building on some of your thoughts on this, I would like to ask the question, can knowledge production and the curriculum really be objective? Um, you know, one of the foundational principles of decolonial thinking is that knowledge production is not a neutral objective endeavor, right? Um, what are your thoughts on this? You know, let me ask you, because again, like it's not, I don't want it to just be me telling you what I think. Like, what, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think knowledge production and then the way we build our syllabi, the way we build our curriculum, can that be objective or, or neutral? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> uh, I, I just don't want to talk on other people to, to speak out. I don't want, but um, I think knowledge is always personal. You know, you, you, you gain new knowledge and you connect it to knowledge that you already have. And uh, only if you have 
you know, if you have that opportunity to do that, and I think that we can do that with our students when we ask students, you know, to, to connect the new knowledge to their daily life and to their histories, to their background, only then be, knowledge becomes meaningful and it, knowledge sticks because, you know, it's, it, it, it does make sense. So, um, I mean, we start maybe, you know, with, with the so-called objective knowledge of our content, of our discipline. But then when we teach it, I think we should ask students to connect it and therefore make it subjective, if you will, but to connect it to, to the knowledge that they already have and, and the world they live in. So then it becomes subjective, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think that's an old hangover, right? It has to be objective. Knowledge is objective. But, you know, more and more we see that that's never, almost never the case. So, um, yeah, I, I, I truly believe in connecting to the knowledge that is already there. And the students, they construct their own knowledge. And, and you know, that it, it, therefore it is objective in a sense. Okay, thank you. Michelle? Yeah, I, I definitely feel like it's objective, especially when you're talking about humanity, social sciences and things like that as a slide say, because it's gonna depend on the perspective of the people who were involved in, in generating that knowledge or their interpretation of that knowledge in the first place. And so it's always gonna be run through a certain filter. I mean, when I read things, I'm running it through my filter as a 41 year old African-American woman born in a certain place and time. So there's no way that anybody, even if you say these are an objective set of facts, when they're writing it down, when they're notating it, when they're deciding to teach it, when they're deciding what goes in the curriculum, what goes in the syllabus, I mean, that they're going to run that all through their filters. So I feel like it's all objective. And so then what Caroline says is really important, giving people time to integrate what they're learning into their own life experiences, into their own worldview. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And I'm, I'm reading um, Tom's quote. Uh, it's like the story of the fish, but what is this ocean to speak of? And I, I love that. Thank you. Um, and, and I really agree that it's, I mean, I personally think that knowledge production and knowledge and curriculum building is subjective. But again, I don't think like I agree. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think I think pretending that it's objective is a bad thing. Right. Um, I, I was um, you know, I think I, I try to explain, like for me, I, I also do that, take that moment where I tell my students where I'm coming from. I tell my audience where I'm coming from because I think that's important. Um, I, I did that with my dissertation, my PhD dissertation. Um, it was, you know, I put that forward and, and, and I think that everybody should be doing that. Everybody needs to acknowledge that positionality. And just can uh, I just add to that? Yeah. I think sometimes the challenge comes when we bring in our different perspectives and interpretations, but sometimes there is an answer that's quote unquote the correct answer. <laughs> and, and sometimes that causes a little bit of a challenge. And I think of um, like uh, comic strips. I don't know how many of you read The Far Side. That's one of my favorite comic strips, The Far Side. So I belong to this Far Side page on Facebook. And whenever we see some of the comments, there's always people who say, I don't get it. And usually it's some obscure historical or cultural fact that if you were not aware of that one thing, the comic strip doesn't make any sense. And so all it takes is for somebody to say, oh, he's referencing this thing. And they're like, oh, now I get it. And so sometimes if you don't have that knowledge of those like details, those facts, those cultural experiences, you don't fully understand something that might be happening, whether it's a text, a song or whatever, but you do have some kind of reaction. It does make you feel some kind of way you're connecting it to something, but it might not be the thing that's intended. And I remember in one instance, there were people were trying to figure out what does this mean? And people were coming up with all kinds of interpretations of what that particular comic strip meant. And it just so happened that I had seen a 2020 interview with Gary Lawson, where he actually explained that particular cartoon. And I said, oh, this is what it means. Cause he said it, he said, this is what I intended it for it to mean. And if I hadn't seen that, that 2020 
segment, I wouldn't have known what it meant. And so sometimes there is a particular answer, whether it's what was intended by the writer, and we can make all the personal connections we want, but it's not quite what was intended. And I think that's what kind of gets challenging sometimes is when people are looking for an answer and they're connecting with it, but that might not quite be the thing that was intended. So I don't know, it, it just gets you. a little muddy sometimes. And that also can cause, I guess, confusion and pain. Mm -hmm. I know I had an experience where somebody gave a highly offensive, it wasn't here, but somewhere else, mm -hmm. a highly offensive to me. And I won't even get into all of that um, um, demonstration or analogy. And my husband and I just looked at each other with like wide open mouths because we were young and we were like, man, this is just crazy. You, you, you know, and, and it didn't, Rather than enlighten and inform, which it could have done, it offended. And it's because you're not, you feel like that's not funny. That's wrong. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And you might feel like that because you're of a younger, more progressive generation. Just put it like that. And so that can also cause pain and confusion that disconnect, like you're saying. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, that, uh it's interesting that you say all that because this may have been one of the reasons why uh, certain colleges have uh, stopped using a, a test of in English as a foreign language as a primary determining factor for admitting international students to the US because some of the questions or even SAT uh, were very much foreign and, and people were misinterpreted about their background knowledge, their fundamental skills that they need to be able to follow instructions here in the US, just because those questions were foreign and, and they never had experienced them. So context is very important uh, because if a student cannot validate knowledge that is being uh, exposed to them, they can relate it to their background, they may look like they don't have the basic skills when actually they have them. So uh, I agree with all the points uh, uh, several of you have mentioned, especially the context and uh, interpretation, it could be graphic, it could be a uh, verbal, it could be uh, cultural. I know when people are giving me orientation to living in the United States, some things were completely foreign and, and people are being were, were surprised, they say, oh, you don't know this? Oh man, you should be, you should be aware of this. And actually it wasn't my fault. <laughs> you know, so so this, that's what happens. Yeah, and I, that's something I've noticed with my students, right? Um, a, they're historical references. Like I try to show them, <laughs> like you know, if I try to reference a boy band from the '90s, they don't know what I'm talking about. But uh, but it's also that cultural capital, right? Like kind of what um, what their parents may have taught them, or what they've been able to learn about. And sometimes we take for granted. We'll make references to to certain things that we think is is widespread, but not everyone has that same experience um, and ability to, to understand those cultural references. Um, and it may be something very minute, but I think those add up for students who don't have those cultural contexts as well. And, and so moving, we can keep the conversation going, but I'm gonna move forward a little bit, um, is you know the previous quote I had focused on the humanities and social sciences, um, but I did wanna also, kind of, I, I was challenged by our previous workshop where we had our, a Dean of Mathematics kind of, kind of ask us to, about how this material is relevant to, to STEM, you know, and how can we make this, these questions of decolonizing knowledge and, and subjective knowledge and subjective knowledge production um, relevant for faculty who are in STEM um, and, and I'm interested that some of you are in STEM here, so, so I'd love your perspectives on this. Uh, and, and to get that conversation started, I, I thought this quote would be useful. You know, um, Chanda Prescott Weinstein uh, is, um, I think she was the first, let me see exactly what those, that reference is. Uh, she's an award-winning physicist, feminist activist, and the first black woman to earn a PhD in the field of theoretical cosmology. 
And um, she, she, this quote is from her. She says that studying the physical world requires confronting the social world. It means changing institutionalized science so that our presence is natural and our cultures are respected. And I, I'm gonna explore her work more. Um, I've just kind of come across it more tangentially uh, recently. But what I like about this quote is that it, it connects that physical, um, you know, kind of more science, natural science, physical science, area to the kind of social cultural context and and she argues that we very much um, need to identify how sciences and how we study the world is shaped by our social world um, and so I, i'm going to bring in examples um, that are actually more STEM focused for the rest of the session because I want us to think about kind of challenging this idea that it's only about, it's not, and I'm not saying that some people think it's only about the humanities and social sciences. Um, so, so what are we gonna do? Kind of refocusing the, the conversation, decolonizing the curriculum and the classroom involves centering students and reconsidering what we value. It also means identifying and challenging how colonialism shapes our world and including indigenous knowledge and pedagogy. And I would argue, I forgot to amend this slide, but I would argue that it's more than just including indigenous knowledge and pedagogy, but other knowledges, other pedagogies, not just indigenous ones. So for the rest of the, the conversation, I'd like to focus on some practical steps to decolonize curriculum and course planning. And these are the main points that, that I will look at, uh, the principle of doing no harm, um, looking at learning outcomes, talking about the canon, history, activities and approaches, and then news and relevant uh, materials. So um, for me, the, the idea of do no harm is, is really crucial to decolonizing our classrooms and our curriculum. Um, I, this is part of, part, part of what I meant when I talked about intentionality and not having it be an afterthought. Um, and, and I think this, this quote is quite powerful when it says to decolonize teaching, faculty must reflect and commit to changing content and delivery that further marginalizes BIPOC students. BIPOC means um, black, indigenous, and persons of color people of color um, and and I think this is valuable because we don't want our materials to harm students and I don't think any of us go into teaching with that intention right um, that's a given but we we want to consider I think we need to reflect on how our materials or our teaching can harm students so um, I would think about it as doing no harm to our students and their approaches. And I'm not gonna expand on that too much because we, all, we have further sessions on pedagogy that the workshops that will look more at how we can decolonize pedagogy, but I just wanted to mention it. Um, and you wanna think about not doing harm to the land and peoples around you. Um, so the, um, the, Chanda Prescott Weinstein, who I mentioned earlier with that quote, um, the physicist, she, she was talking about how um, in Hawaii, when they were bringing in kind of a, um, setting up these large telescopes to be able to, to um, you know, to do work around physics um, and kind of studying space and stars and all that. Um, I don't wanna kind of misspeak on the science of it, but that this large telescope was, was put in place against the wishes of indigenous native um, Hawaiians who thought that the land, you know, who, who for them, the land is sacred and that the placement of that telescope was kind of challenging their, um, you know, was against their wishes. And, and so what, how does this relate to our teaching is that, what we teach folks, you know, can be harmful, but also it's thinking about the knowledge and how it was produced and how, and whether there was harm done in that knowledge production. And, and I think that's something that we need to actively be thinking about 
and, and be critical about and, and examining when we use materials. Does that mean that we're not gonna use uh, data and information that was derived from this kind of telescope? No, maybe not, but maybe we need to acknowledge it and, and pay respect to, to, that, to that issue. I'm gonna, I'm gonna really apologize now because um, my mom is at the door. My baby, my husband took my baby to her, my mom's and but left the milk here. So I'm gonna go let her in real quick because she's at my door. I apologize. I'll be back in a second. I'm so sorry. Please keep the conversation. Okay. We can um, kind of go through some of the things in the chat because um, I know a few things have popped up. I don't know if anybody wanted to elaborate on some of their comments that they posted here. Let me just scroll back. Um, I know we there was some talk about standardized tests. I don't know if we, I guess we've resolved all those things. Um, uh, Michelle, I think you mentioned something about STEAM. I didn't, I don't know if you wanted to elaborate. There was something on that earlier slide. I wish I could go back. Where oh, she about, um, <laughs> I can. Oh, you got it. Do you want me to go back? I'm back. Sorry. No, I was that. just going through the chat and seeing if anybody wanted to follow up on their, their comments. There was on a previous slide or the slide before, she just had something about um, uh, STEM. And I forgot exactly what the wording was, but it made me think of our program. If I see the slide, it'll probably drag my memory. I think it was the one about the physical world. Yep, yep, yep. And then, okay, that jogged my memory. And she was talking about how she wasn't seen or respected as a science scientist mm. because she was the first of that first, help me out here. It was your information. Oh, the first uh, uh, black, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I wasn't sure. Um, she was the first black woman to earn a PhD in the, in the field of theoretical cosmology. Yeah, so there you go. And she says she didn't feel seen, which that is awesome and cool, but she didn't feel seen. And I'm saying it's so great that we have STEAM. So the young women of color who are studying science here can feel that, feel that they have a community and they're, and, and they're welcome. Mm -hmm. yeah, th that, yeah, was, that was another program, yeah. actually, Caroline, well, that you women, had. Yeah. Wasn't it, it was called, didn't you have a program? lead a program once it, or it was for faculty of women women faculty of color I think you had a few years back yeah we had a we had a group it was a learning oh community I'm sorry of women, okay. of women of color in STEM so faculty okay. that's what it was uh, in, in STEM and it was just a you know discussion group and to exchange experiences and to exchange experiences what it's like to be a woman of color in the sciences, a woman of color in the sciences. So, right. Uh, I apologize. I had it wrong. And, um, that's okay. Right. And historically, think, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Go historically ahead. speaking, we have had um, many scientists that have been women whose work have not been uh, credited to them and their work has been taken from them just because of their gender. And so I think we've come a long way and it's fantastic. And I just love this topic. <laughs> well, and, and hopefully maybe I might pick some of your brains as well like, later on because we're working towards um, uh, some programming in the, in the spring around kind of sexism in higher education. And, and I think that there's a lot to, to hear from folks at MC who, who, you know, kind of have these perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I apologize for the interruption. <laughs> um, I thought I had it all planned out. And, <laughs> and then, <laughs> so we were talking about not doing harm. And the last point that I'll talk about uh, is kind of thinking, you know, along the lines of subjective knowledge production is what are practical applications of your field, right? Kind of, um, um, I'm sorry. So, so thinking about what is what is used, uh, what what is accomplished through your your field, um, is well, some examples that I was thinking about is how like surveillance, you know, technology can be problematic if it's used to surveil uh, racialized folks. Um, uh, or used to to weaponize um, people and to to control borders, you know, things like that. Thinking about what does my field do in terms of and the impact it has on the wider community. 
So I'm gonna, oops. The next kind of exercise that I want us to think about and the next step is thinking about learning outcomes. Um, so I want you to reflect on this for a few minutes is thinking about if you have, you know, a course and you have learning outcomes, can you develop accessible course goals, outcomes and expectations that center student learning um, to reduce harm? And in so doing, in doing so, can you name a system of oppression? So if you have on hand a kind of course outcome, learning outcome of yours, can you think about how you could apply some kind of respond to some of these questions to your existing learning outcomes? I'm gonna let you reflect on this for two or three minutes and then we'll, we'll share. So um, this is a tough one, I, I think. <laughs> um, I wanna, I don't know, do you, if you're being asked this, about this exercise or being asked to do this exercise, um, what is your initial reaction or what are your initial thoughts? I was, I was going to say that a, a scenario that can bring a, a problem like that is if, if someone is uh, teaching a course and uh, is particularly focused on content, content pre-planned and uh, rights learning outcomes are just intended to bring back all that information that was produced by the instructor. And there was no integration of students' experiences, uh, no assignments uh, involved students going out and relating to whatever the concept presented uh, is related to their environment. Uh, that can be a little bit of damaging because there is no challenge. Uh, it, it's just reproducing. And some of that information, if validated by, by a student, could, be, could turn out to be unclear. Uh, and, and so you will just be regurgitating the same information. Uh, I, I would uh, relate that to uh, maybe, uh, for example, some of the things we've been observing around the country here, people challenging uh, signs or museums or people who are being reflected in the books as his, uh, prominent historical figures when actually, when uh, reviewed, people are challenging them, uh, taking their pictures down, things like that. Or I can relate it to an educational system that we referred to earlier, which was uh, in a colonial environment, which we used to call indoctrinating kind of education, where people will be forced to learn about things away from the environment where they are located. And, and they will never be given a chance to, to challenge that and question why isn't there something drawn from my own con contextual environment. Okay, thank you. Um, Relega? Yeah, uh, as I as I told you in the beginning, whenever you speak and whenever a lead speaks, I feel the need to listen and to write down. So I have so many notes here. Thank you for everything. Um, as I said, I am a physics professor, and uh, of course, I'm interested in uh, understanding how can I apply everything that you said, Gabby, and in STEM. Um, and I wanted to check with you because all your questions have been extremely thoughtful. And for me, I had a lot of reflections there. But for this one, on um, if I can develop uh, course goals, I actually did think along these lines. And uh, at that time, I changed my overarching goal. I know we have to stick with the goals and the learning outcomes that are in the catalog, but I added like an overarching goal, uh, problem solving. And I said, if physics can help people in real world is through the problem solving algorithm that we imply for every single problem that we do. So I struggle to show the students if for 90% of the semester we focus on applying the problem solving steps for physics problems that involve real world situations. For 10% of the semester, towards the end of the semester, I uh, try to uh, show the students clearly how we can extrapolate the steps that we follow when we solve a physics problem to a, to a real world problem, any problem, family problem, job related problem, a personal problem. And we, we work on examples like this, such that hopefully 
uh, I try to convey the message that um, you work one semester to learn what problem solving means, but can you work the rest of the life to apply these principles and uh, become the best problem solver that you can be? Because we all face problems and life is about problems. And if we have a good recipe to follow, we will feel secure and we will feel peaceful and we'll just go through the process and won't be distracted by the problems. So I'm not sure, I'm looking for ideas, as I said here, you are so experts, um, but that was one way for me to um, try to apply the, let's say, dry physics con uh, content, because to some people could be dry um, to real world. And then um, I um, also, with the second question here, you know, when you mentioned the systems of oppression, that made me think a lot because um, you, and I, I would appreciate if you actually give me an advice. Uh, um, what I am thinking is uh, whenever I uh, prepare the course, of course, physics is to some extent an objective. Yeah, the principles, the laws, they are uh, to some extent objectives, but I want the students to get it. So I'm interested in the subjective part to make sure that they actually get it. So I have to attend to the students' needs. I have to build on their thinking, and there is a lot of subjectivity coming in this area. So when I think of systems of oppression, you know what I think? I think uh, that I need to identify for each um, uh, course, what students are struggling with. For me, this could create uh, uh, um, feelings of oppression or discomfort or uh, make students be disconnected to my knowledge. And I want them to stay connected to the knowledge and to the learning. So what do I do? I try to get some feedback from them in during office hours. I mean, I may ask a question that is not related to what we did. Uh, I may uh, email students to check in about one aspect or another and indirectly I may figure out if, if they struggle with something. And I also have weekly anonymous surveys, mini surveys, just five minutes to check on them. And this is where I identify, I try to identify what students are struggling with. And this is how I would interpret the, the systems of oppression. And then I'll try to work on them. Uh, I can say that so far, what I saw in my courses, uh, like a trend, if you want, is uh, deadlines. I mean, deadlines. So I created soft deadlines and hard deadlines. <laughs> and soft deadlines are for people to be relaxed and be on top of everything and have everything done on time. And hard deadlines are for people who experience occasionally unusual circumstances, but they can still get a good grade. They can still be on top of everything. So um, I don't know, this was my input, but again, <laughs> help me. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Katya, if I may uh, uh, respond to this question. I think when you want to do, when you run, want to reduce doing, reduce doing harm to the students through your outcomes, goals, and expectations, I think of uh, it's, it's about that connection and, and, you know, that's been said before, connection to the daily life. So if you have one of your outcomes is that students make that connection. So, you know, you can look for that and you can uh, create activities. So they do make that connection with the knowledge, the objective knowledge to their daily life. But I think the system of oppression is colorblindness. So if you pretend that we're all objective and that, you know, uh, there, you know, there are, are, are good uh, examples or, you know, good ways to answer in, in exams that are objective. But if you, if you deny, if, or if, you, if you think you're colorblind, I think that is in itself oppression, right, of people of color. That's my two cents here. I wrote my whole PhD on colorblindness as oppression, so I, <laughs> I'm on, wow. I'm on that. Um, but, um, I, and, and to Relica, I think your examples were, you know, really inspiring actually, because I, I think, you know, I don't necessarily think that I have all the answers and, and part of this workshop is to get, is to, to get us 
thinking about it and sharing and to learn from each other. So um, I appreciate all of these these thoughts. Um, and and again, yeah, I, I also I think that it's it's harmful to pretend to our students that we don't see their differences and that we don't see their different experiences um, and, and how they are. Any other thoughts on this? Yeah, something that comes to mind to me is uh, code switching because it's not about telling them um, what you grew up with is wrong. Uh, and it's not about telling them, if you want to be a scientist, you have to act this way. It's both. And, and it's important that, you know, think about uh, anyone who's gotten a doctorate. There are some pretty strong cultural uh, milieu that you need to learn to navigate through. And you either do or you don't. So there are times where learning to navigate through the dominant culture is just a fact but that doesn't negate who you are or your history. It's not an either or. And code switching was one way of talking about it's both and you can switch at will and that enables you to navigate multiple contexts with ease and maybe even to be a bridge. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and I think it's, it's also like, it's very much a survival, right? Like code switching is, is a mode as a way of of surviving um, those different cultures or experiences. Yeah, I think I agree with Tom. Some of that is play, playing a, a role. Uh, for example, set your there's certain expectations that you have to abide by in order to get through. Uh, even as you mentioned about doctoral dissertation, when you are picking committee members and how you navigate interests of different committee members to satisfy their needs so your dissertation can go through. Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> it happens a lot. I, I, and you know, I, I did it with, I do it with my students too. Like I, first day of class, the first few years I was teaching, I would be dressed so professionally, like never wear jeans, have like a nice bag. Um, but then as I got more comfortable with my teaching, I kind of relaxed that. Um, and I would, you know, kind of be a little bit more comfortable in my in how I presented myself. But I still had to do some management because, you know, students perceive me as young and um, a woman, a woman of color. So, so there are different dynamics there. But, but, you know, uh, they do it, we do it, and and so I think those dynamics are also really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, th so um, I, I I put this here just in case anybody did not have like course outcomes to think about um you know kind of this is sociology 100 one of the, the big courses students a lot of students take this class and um kind of thinking about how i could incorporate those those principles here but i'm going to move on now just for the kind of time sake um let's talk about the canon a little bit you know kind of so so if we're trying to do that work um yeah, Katia, I just wanted to let you know yeah. we have about 10 minutes left in the session. Okay. <laughs> it's gone by quickly. It has. Yeah. Um, well, at least for me. But uh, yeah, so kind of, I think the next few slides are just um, some thoughts and kind of guiding questions for, for, for implementing some of, um, operationalizing some of these ideas, you know. So if you want to diversify what you teach and, and how you build your, your syllabus and your readings, um, or materials, not just readings. It, it's thinking about whose voices do you amplify and which knowledge do you prioritize? Um, kind of what are the must reads in your discipline and, and why are they must reads? You know? So I think um, part of this exercise of, of decolonizing is thinking about what you take, what we take for granted in our discipline and, and whether they're still, you know, is it crucial that we teach like sociology 100 the way we've always taught sociology 100 by, by introducing the same figures? Or can we bring in different examples? Can we kind of, that still teach the same thing, but, but maybe from different perspectives. Um, and so it's kind of, I think part of our disciplinary work is thinking about how can we expand the canon? Um, and, and, and I think it's important to think about do, 
do all of our courses begin with theories, examples, case studies, and materials that are mainly European or white or Western, you know, kind of, uh, it, uh, that's, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but, but I think asking ourselves that question is important. And um, are we, are the materials and resources inclusive? To, to all these different statuses, race, social economic standing, immigration st status, et cetera. Um, and, and this speaks to, to um, you know, I think um, Relica's point earlier about kind of the application of physics, right? Kind of, do you make your materials, can we make our materials relevant to the real lives um, of our students, but in particular to those who experience marginalization? Um, it's kind of, you know, just some questions we can think about to, to diversify our canon. And part of that is also then thinking about, if we're thinking about the history of our discipline, um, you can think about, well, how's it, it's not just about diversifying the canon, right, who we teach, but also trying to address the question of whether our disciplines have ben benefited from or, and perpetuated colonialism and racialization, you know. Um, higher education, has been a tool of oppression, right? Like, I think we need to acknowledge that in this discussion of decolonizing. Um, and so within the discipline, in, in terms of who's been excluded, um, and then also within its applications, as we as I mentioned earlier, um, kind of, of how certain fields might contribute or through the, the outputs might contribute to, to continuing oppression, racism, and colonialism. Um, so I just included some examples from this year of, uh, of how artificial intelligence um, kind of has been found to be potentially racist in its application in certain settings. Uh, Michelle, go ahead. Might be slightly off topic, but it always struck me both in high school and um, in my undergrad, how I always took courses in black history and um, and black literature because I wanted to, but they were always counted as electives. And yet courses in European history, courses in European literature, courses in American history, courses in American literature, they were always core courses. And that always struck me as being wrong, even though I took the courses because I wanted the knowledge in my heart as electives. You know what I mean? I know it's slightly off topic, but I always thought that was wrong that yeah, I'll just leave it Absolutely. at that. Absolutely. I think it's very on topic. And I think, you know, that's more kind of the programmatic level. What is considered the default history or not, you know, like the default knowledge um, uh, as the must haves in a program and, and what is considered the kind of the neutral, right? The kind of the, the, uh, the baseline of, of, of education. Um, and, and, I, and thinking about, so, so I think in, in how, what can we do then to, to address this, and it's not just, okay, thinking about these questions, how has your discipline benefited from, from these things? How does it continue to benefit or pe perpetuate? And then including that in your course, right? Including that in your materials, talking to your students about it. And so it becomes kind of an iterative process where we're building that knowledge to include, to include these, these questions. Um, and so this is just some further questions on this topic is, is thinking about, can you integrate a more expansive historical understanding of your discipline? And can you include um, kind of different BIPOC or non-Western cultures and histories in your materials? And I wanted to use this example of ethnomathematics. Like I said, I was challenged by uh, Dean Milton Nash last time <laughs> by his feedback to us. And I wanted to explore, well, how can we decolonize mathematics? Um, and so, you know, I think like I've, I've been learning about the field of ethnomathematics, which is um, what, what, how do we define this? Uh, it's, it's defined by a Brazilian mathematician, Uberatan D'Ambrosio, as intersections of culture, historical tradition, social cultural roots, and mathematics. And it seeks to answer the perennial question of students in mathematics classes everywhere, what's the relevance? So this field of ethnomathematics tries to kind of bring these different perspectives to studying maths. Um, and, and part of that is, is considering the different locations of, of maths and the different emergence of, 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 of studies of mathematics from different 
eras and and cultures and I, I played around a little bit with these different kind of ways of expressing my birth year in in different kind of uh, mathematical expressions here um, so this is just one example so you know if you want to diversify or decolonize your your canon you can start to think about those critical materials um, actively engaging with uh, BIPOC literature and frameworks and perspectives and theories and bringing in those, you know, kind of actively bringing in liberation focused images um, and, and bringing in kind of decolonizing into, into your courses. Another example that I thought would be useful in thinking about activities and approaches, you know, kind of now like practical things is, um, how can we potentially incorporate these different perspectives um, into our activities? So I like this example from a professor from a Canadian university uh, who, you know, she, she expresses how she started out with land acknowledgements in her class, but then she wanted to take a little bit further and, and weaving in indigenous materials and indigenous ways of learning um, into kind of the everyday life of the class. And this work is part of some really interesting work that's happening in Canada right now around um, the truth and reconciliation and um, kind of a goal, you know, a really clear cut goal to indigenize um, higher education. Um, so if you are interested in this, I really encourage you to to do some reading on this because it's, it's fascinating. Although, and, but then it kind of gets me to thinking about some problematic aspects of this work uh, because this professor also talks about how she is doing the talking stick ceremony in her classroom. So in bringing in indigenous um, practices to her classroom, are we, you know, and I don't know, I, I, I couldn't find out more about her background, but I, I, my first thought was we need to be careful to not further harm students or further harm indigenous populations in the way that maybe we're trying to incorporate practices in our teaching. And so I, I was, I want to in include this example because for me, I kind of, it made me raise my eyebrow that she introduced the ceremony into her class uh, because I wasn't sure, you know, at which point is it cultural appropriation and is that going to be a problem for her students or for indigenous communities now i need to do more research on this i don't know exactly so but i i want to kind of throw that out there as like a little caveat of like you know what does it mean if we're trying to decolonize our approaches and our practices what do we still need to be careful about um, I liked, I'm sorry, I know I'm going a little bit quickly now, but I like this exercise uh, that another professor does. Uh, and instead of asking students, where are you from? You know, introductions, it, she asks the question, where do you know from? And I think this really touches upon the positionality aspect that we were talking about earlier. So it's not just about like the professor, you know, us instructors um, thinking about our positionality, but it's also, shifting how we think about our students. And, and by asking the question in this way, where do you know from, you're asking students to reflect on their own learning experiences, their own positionalities, in order for them to bring that knowledge as contributors to the classroom. And that I think speaks to the student-centered aspect of decolonizing knowledge and um, the fact that decolonizing knowledge actually needs to put you know, include students in that process. So um, I really like this exercise that I found. And these are the questions that she asks, you know, what is your name, what pronouns, but then these are more interesting. And um, I can share the link with you if you're interested, but I had it on the other page um, because she expands on what these questions involve a, a bit more deeply. And, and I think they're really, I, I, I really like this approach actually. And I want to test it out um, next semester. Um, and finally, the last point I want to do is, is think about incorporating relevant or current affairs. And I think that, um, you know, this has happened a lot in the last few years, kind of big things happen in our society, right? And um, our students are impacted by them. And so I think that sometimes, like for me, it has felt very disingenuous to walk into a classroom or into a Zoom room 
and not acknowledge that, not acknowledge that uh, there's a pandemic or not acknowledge that uh, there's police violence, you know, that seems disproportionately to impact people of color, um, not, or that there are protests, or as this image evokes, that there's a, a living history, you know, that the history of, of these schools in Canada where there were found mass graves of indigenous children, um, that that's not traumatic for, for folks because we might like to think and people might want to say, you know, why are we decolonizing? We're, we're not a colony. Well, we're very much a settler, you know, this country is very much a settler country. Um, but also the colonialism and the trauma and, and kind of violence of it is still impactful today, right? And still and shapes our world. So um, I think I think incorporating and acknowledging current events as they as much as we can, you know, and, and that makes sense for our courses, uh, it is valuable for we're thinking about the importance of decolonizing today. Um, and just to kind of summarize, you know, I think um, this is what I talked about at the beginning, but I think we've built a lot about on this together through the conversation. Um, kind of, it really, for me, decolonizing is about expanding perspectives um, and to have that active and continued engagement with marginalized vo voices but not to just erase or tokenize or replace, right? It's, um, I think it's a, it can be a powerful and hopeful um, movement in our classrooms and in our work. And so, you know, I think like maybe to close off, I know if you have to go, um, please feel free to go, but if you have some thoughts about what your next steps are, I'd love to hear them if you wanna share them. And, and I'm gonna stop my share now just so I can see your faces. And, um, yeah, just to know Gloria has post, posted a link in the chat. Um, if you could give feedback, that would be extremely helpful. And then we can go through a couple of notes in the chat. I think Henry just asked, um, where's your question? Sorry, who decides what is classic? I don't know if you were posing that question to the group or if it was more rhetorical. No, 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 I, no <laughs> yeah, it was, it was more rhetorical. Okay, got it. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's a, it's a, and I think that speaks to Michelle's point, right? Like, kind of, what is the, what is the crucial learning that we need to learn, right? Yeah, and I think you also made the note: the goal isn't to get rid of what, what is quote unquote classic, but to you bring in different perspectives. And the same question Henry just raised: well, why is this classic? Who decided that? Whose voice was left out? who would not agree that this is classic, who would, you know, identify something else as classic, so. Yeah. Can I have um, the slides? Can yeah, I have sure. the slides? Thank you. Definitely. Any, I don't know, any final thoughts of, of, of something you maybe have taken away that you want to try or think about in, in your work? A lot of ideas, but um, <laughs> hard to <laughs> kind of formulate them because I've been taking notes and just, um, yeah, it'll be it's a really good session. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate everyone's participation and ideas. I was taking notes too. I was like, <laughs> you know, I think that there's a, a, a lot of exciting things that can come out of this. Uh, and I appreciate all your, all your thoughts and, and, and for, working on this with me. There's a lot of good notes and comments in the chat as well. So if you want, I can clean up the chat and make that available and send it to everyone in case you want to refer back to some of those notes. Definitely, thank you. And, and thank you to all, I wasn't very engaged in the chat, but um, but thank you for, for all those additional points that were made there. This was so great. I loved it so much, even though I'm not a teacher per se, I think everybody, there's a lot to learn. Thank you. Yeah, no, and I think it's applicable even outside, you know, like, I mean, it's it's applicable outside of the traditional classroom at MC, but I, I don't think you were here yet, Michelle, but, you know, I, 
I, I know I've attended a lot of your different workshops from Tom, Caroline, Michelle, I think, you know, I, I, Gloria, I don't know who else, but um, I've been, I've seen your work, or uh, Henry as well, right? So, so there is a, uh, applicability of these principles and ideas in all areas of our work. Yeah, we and write outcomes too. <laughs> That's true. And it's also, <laughs> no, go ahead, sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's like where we're going, right? It's where education's heading, hopefully. That, um, this and like I said in the this... beginning, it's taken so long to get here. I know, you know right? I, Carol, I, we... did, I came from Holland in 1989, and the word, you know, the anti racist was just not used in this country. I mean, it was in Europe, but not in this country. And it's taken, you know, almost 30 years. And I'm, like I said before, you know, Change happens slowly, I guess, but it's just wonderful that even at our, you know, at the institutional level, we're giving it so much attention. Love it. So Caroline, it's so interesting you said that because somebody said, and I think it was you, something about, you know, that colorblind was not the goal and it's not because you're marginalizing an entire group of people and making it like we don't exist because we're not in the majority. But when you said that, it really struck me because when I was a kid in America, the goal was colorblindness. That's how people tried to treat you if you were a person of color and you don't feel seen. And I'm so glad that it has evolved. So like you said, we're just continually evolving our knowledge and improving who we are as people. Right. Good point. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all. Um, I, I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you for being here. If, you know, I'll stick around for two minutes if there's any any questions or um, any, you know comments. Uh, but thank you so much for your time and for being here and for the conversation. I hope we to see you again soon. <laughs>